so nice to see everybody. Um, my name is Naomi Stead and I am a professor and head of the Department of, the Ar of Architecture, the Architecture at Monash University. And here tonight, I'm in the role of host, representing both Monash, which is the virtual digital host of this event, and Parlour, of which I am a co-founder. So welcome everybody, and it's really wonderful to see you for our first ever Parlour Online Salon. Uh, on behalf of Parlour, as always, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of, of country across Australia's many nations and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and to the Indigenous Australians who are part of the Parlour community. In addition, we must acknowledge the pain and conflict that is being felt and experienced around the world at this moment. And further, to acknowledge that the recent death of George Floyd, as deeply upsetting as this is, is not an isolated incident. Rather, it is the latest in a series of unnecessary deaths at the hands of systemic racism, not only in America, but also in Australia. We all have a unique responsibility to dismantle these system, to dismantle the system, and we all hold different skills and capacities to contribute to change. It is up to each of us to determine what that is, but for all of us, it starts with listening and education. Yesterday here in Australia was the last day of Reconciliation Week, and tonight, if we could ask you to do one thing in relation to that, it is to take some time to learn something about Australia's history that you didn't know before, and where possible to learn that from an Indigenous voice. Willful ignorance, we would argue, cannot be an acceptable position to take if we want a future as equals. So with that extended acknowledgement of country, I pass to Justine. Thank you, Naomi. Um, um, so I guess we're going to have a slight shift in tempo. I think that's a, a but I think we're all um, trying to operate in this world where we're dealing with these sort of devastating circumstances and trying to also continue um, with our daily lives. So um, welcome to you all. So we are very pleased to see you all here and we're very pleased to have um, a salon online for the very first time. Um, and as you all have seen, we're still juggling around with technology. This is the first time we've, Naomi and I have run a couple of other online events, but this is the first time we've tried to do a salon and the first time we've tried to do one in the evening. Um, so please bear with us and please give us feedback, um, constructive positive, negative, whatever, but you know, preferably constructive. Um, so as many of you know, I know many of you have been to salons, you know, in the flesh. Uh, one of the aims is really to provide an informal and friendly space for people to get together. Um, we've held them all across Australia. And so now it's one of the real exciting opportunities of doing them online is that we can bring people together from across Australia. And it's really fantastic to see just where people are booking from. Um, and I want to um, recognise the enthusiasm of Alison McFadden and Emma Healy, um, who encouraged us to go online. Um, I had just imagined we might put the salons on hold until we could meet again, again in real life. Um, but Ali and Emma both thought that there was a lot of opportunity to come online, and I think they're entirely right, and they've both worked really hard to make it happen. Um, and I also, of course, want to, as always, acknowledge the ongoing and deep support of AWS, our partner who make the whole salon program happen, and Erin Middleton from Monash, who is just the sort of a Zoom whiz, who's been helping us to work out how on earth we do this. Um, and um, I've learned a lot about Zoom in the last couple of weeks from Erin, so thank you, Erin. So if you've been to a salon before, you know that they're quite casual, they're quite informal, there's not very many rules. The speakers, uh, we just give them the microphones and they do whatever they want with them. Um, so all of that's continuing. And you'll also probably know that there's one rule for you as members of the audience, and that is that you have to try and talk to at least one person you don't already know. And in real life, that kind of works quite well. People go and introduce themselves. Um, uh, in our online version, we're um, expediting that. We're going to be putting you all into Zoom breakout rooms um, with a selection of other people. We've allocated you in a relatively ad hoc way, um, but we did try to make sure that we had people from different places in each room. Um, and Ali's going to send you some prompts to get your conversation going, and I hope, it, I hope it's fun. I hope you meet new people, and I hope 
you know, things happen. Um, this is the most experimental out part of the of the event for us. Um, so yeah, let's just please bear with us if it takes a while to get that sorted out. Um, so before we go into the breakout rooms, we'll have a few questions um, to our speakers, Josephine and Jocelyn. And if you can do those through the chat function, um, we'll try and keep an eye on those, and then we'll pick out. We won't be able to pose all questions, but we'll probably we'll pick out a couple. We'll ask you then to put your question because, as Naomi said before, we really like this sort of mosaic of of people. We like the sense that you're all there. Um, rather than you know having a format where we can't see you so it will hear from you. Um, as I said, it's an experiment. We're really keen to have your feedback. Um, so uh, just let us know. But I'm now going to hand over to um, Alison and Emma who are each going to introduce one of our speakers for the evening and then we will have the great pleasure of listening to our speakers for approximately half an hour. Alison. Thank you, Justine. So I'm going to introduce Jocelyn, who's a registered architect, registered landscape architect and urban designer with 18 years experience in consulting and client side roles. She's also currently the director of City Design Studio at the City of Melbourne, where she leads an interdisciplinary team of urban designers, architects, landscape architects and industrial designers. She's passionate about creating high quality, sustainable, enduring civic spaces and has a broad range of experience in the design, procurement and management of vibrant urban places. Uh, Jocelyn has also led the campus master planning and design at Monash University for a number of years where she was charged with embedding a culture of curation and design. She co-authored the university's first public art master plan was a founder, founding member of its public art committee, managed its first design review panel and architect selection committee and contributed to the AIA national guidelines on procurement. I also love the story that Justine tells me is um, where they met was via Marion's List and I'm using that as a little plug to put your details on Marion's List if you haven't done so because Parla sure has benefited from that. Thank you, and now I hand it over to Emma. Thanks, Ali. I'm going to introduce Josephine McLeod. I have been wanting to hear from Jo for a, for a while. She's one of those people that um, is very well connected and does a lot of listening and stays in the background a lot of the time, and they're the kind of people I like to hear from. Um, so she's currently the Principal Advisor for Architecture and Urban, Urban Design at the Office of the Queensland Government Architect. Prior to that, um, she was working in practice um, in a number of different um, crossover type disciplines. Um, we worked at the same practice, but not at the same time. And she's worked on um, a number of award-winning buildings as well. Um, she is an architect, urbanist and advocate with over 15 years experience working within the built environment. In her current role, she um, is guiding policy, undertaking design reviews and providing urban design advice to support well-made, sustainable and healthy communities throughout Queensland. Josephine is passionate about creative and collaborative design processes that respond to place and the people who interact with them. Her current focus is on Healthy Places, Healthy People, a joint initiative with Queensland Health that seeks to bring together Queensland government agencies to measure, monitor, report and better understand our collective impact on Queensland's built and natural environment features to support healthy and active living. So thank you, Joe and Justin. Okay, so I guess now we're handing over the metaphorical microphones. Um, you know, I would might do that theatrically were we in a space together, but um, here we go. Here's your microphones, Joe and Jocelyn. <laughs> Thanks, Justine. Thanks, Ali, and thanks, Emma um, and Naomi. Um, jo, I'm really excited to be talking to you. And I know that we, we met for the first time, I think it was on Friday, um, and we, we bonded over a really random thing. <laughs> I'm, and, and then we actually got together a couple of, you know, a, a bit of a running sheet for tonight. I'm, a, I, I'm already going to sort of um, shift away from convention because I think that we got paired up because we both work in the public sector. And so I, I guess the per first question I'm going to throw to you is 
how did you end up in state government and what drew you there in the first place? Was it something that you were drawn to from, you know, the outset, so when you graduated? Thanks, Joss. And I have to apologise. Because of government, I'm actually not allowed to use Zoom. The Zoom, Zoom app is blocked, so I've had to go through the browser. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Okay, I suppose I never anticipated a career in government, but in many ways it's been full circle because my first role was in government through an initiative called the Architectural Practice Academy, which was created in 2003 for emerging architects straight out of university to teach them about the practice of architecture. It was quite a unique opportunity where six graduates got to run practice, run projects and also understand about project management. And it was back in 2003 within the department and now here I am 15 years later in the department doing a very different role. And I suppose the academy, while an incredible pra practice experience, also opened up a lot of professional networks for me. For each project we worked on, we were paired with a mentor from private practice. So through that experience, I managed to meet a lot of practitioners who were really invested in teaching young graduates about practice. For the 15 years I practiced, I worked in practice who, practices who I'd made connections through while working at the APA. It's sort of a funny thing coming back to government now, but I've been here for four years and I'm still really learning stuff, learning a lot about government. Being an architect in government is such a different thing to being in practice, but I really enjoy being able to influence things. You apply the skills that you learnt at university, design thinking skills, but in a completely different context. I mean, just... How did you find university prepared you for the role that you're in now? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> how did university prepare? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. I feel, um, I don't know. I think that university equips you in some ways, you know, maybe technically, um, but all of the social, the political, the um, the management, the um, just, I don't know, there's so much that you learn when you're actually on the job and there's so much that you realise you don't know the older you get as well and the more experienced you get. So uh, I, I think what university, university was, what university did for me was that it just opened up my world. Um, I grew up in uh, the inner northwest um, suburbs of Melbourne. Um, it you know, it was, uh, I went to a public school and the school that I went to really, really prioritised sport. Um, and so that was what I invested my time in. Um, I loved, um, I loved the creative arts and the visual arts especially, but I was talked out of doing them in, in BCE. Um, so that was, you know, levels 11 and 12. And, um, and so I focused on the sciences instead, which just, I didn't really have any flair for them. I was above average maybe in science and that's what I pursued initially at university. And then I kind of questioned, what the hell am I doing? I'm, I'm no good at this. Um, and I, I enjoyed it. I'm, you know, I, I, so that's what I love about university, I guess. You just get exposed to so, so much. It's, um, I think it's true to its name, like university, it's, it's a universal education. So you get exposed to different types of people, um, different areas of learning. Um, and, and I think that was the best bit about it because it really kind of consolidated, um, I guess, an outlook that I still have today, which is just, you know, this um, thirst for learning new things all the time. All right. I was going to say, it's pretty impressive that you've got two degrees when well, I'm just proud of my single degree. How did you come about having two degrees? Um, I, I've actually got three. I don't say that to show off, but it's only because I think a lot of people actually have multiple degrees now. So the Bachelor of Architecture, um, when I went through Melbourne University, was you actually had to do a two-part, um, a, a dual degree. So you did the Bachelor of of planning and design um, and that was often with other people who you know then went on to the Bachelor of Property and Construction and other things uh, and then you did the Bachelor of Architecture and I graduated from that with honours. Um, I think it was in the first year of the Bachelor of Architecture that I just realised that it whilst I loved architecture I didn't love it in and of itself. I really liked the doors that it opened to other areas of design like landscape architecture and urban design and so they were the sort of um, design studios that I gravitated towards that they were the ones where you know 
the um, project might start with an urban design framework or an urban design premise and then you know um, in the second half of the semester might drill down into an architectural proposition um, and so I spoke to the faculty about you know maybe letting me do landscape architecture at the same time <laughs> and then I was just very fortunate I was um, a student representative on the faculty board so um, uh, ended up meeting my first employer through through that medium um, and and spent the first you know seven years of my career in working on urban design projects and really getting a chance to sort of practice in a really multidisciplinary way using um, I guess the skills that I've learned in those two areas in architecture and landscape. Joe, you're a multidisciplinary practitioner as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So I was going to say, Joss, I think we've had some similarities between us in that we've both had some sort of landscape background because when I finished at the Architectural Practice Academy, my first role in commercial practice was with EDL, which was a global landscape architecture practice. And I think it's a really humble, humbling experience working for practice when you're not the lead consultant most of the time. Like there were 60 people in that practice and three of them were architects. So I think you definitely come to appreciate architecture as a piece of the broader landscape. And I designed a lot of toilet blocks in that time. But I have to say that toilet blocks are a very undervalued typo typology. And I can't complain too much because one of those toilet blocks sent me to France, which was really lovely. I did a toilet block in France, so I can claim that, which is pretty impressive. Uh, Joe, you're, um, going to, <laughs> you're going to have to expand on the toilet block in France. I think I think a lot of our younger <laughs> listeners might be thinking, I want to work in toilet blocks now. <laughs> I know. Who would have thought, right? I mean, I'm probably downplaying it a bit, but it was part of a memorial that we designed in the north of France and it just had happened to have a public toilet. The memorial itself was actually fairly simple, so a big component of the project ended up being a public toilet. The irony was that we flew all the way to France and I got food poisoning the night before we were supposed to present to the mayor. So I didn't even end up presenting the design in the end, but nonetheless, he was happy with it, so that was good. And I got a trip to France, so that was pretty good. But through my time at EDOR, I did a fair bit of master planning too and sort of got exposed to urban planning and also urban design. So I think both of us have very similar experiences there. And it's a very unique set of skills you have to apply. Architectural skills get applied at a much broader scale thinking. I mean, you've spent a bit of time at Monash University working on their master plan. Tell me about how you ended up at university and how that experience was. It was such a funny transition to make. I um, Look, I initially, I, I'd been at, um, uh, in private practice for, I don't know, it'd been, been about seven or eight years. And um, I loved working on urban, in urban design. I loved producing master plans. I loved producing like urban design frameworks and conceptual, you know, designs for community housing and things like that. But I actually got to a point in my career where I thought, oh my God, I don't want to get to the end of my career and feel like everything I produce just sits on a bookshelf. Um, and that was the moment where I kind of thought I, I need to try something else. Um, an opportunity came up to um, interview for the role of advisor um, at Monash University. And so um, I went for that interview and, um, and uh, got the role. Um, and then that really just opened the door to, to then this other role to, to manage the um, master plan implementation um, at, you know, at, at the university. And so I, I, it's a bit of serendipity. It's a little bit of, um, you know, having prepared, um, I, I guess having, you know, invested in the right background for that kind of role. Um, and then really just pursuing it once I got into it. So once I got the manager um, campus design role at Monash, I, I just took, took every opportunity to invest in design, um, to influence through design. Um, and the projects that we had at the start, they were really small. I mean, um, an example that I can bring you know, um, share with, with, with everyone here is I was asked by um, my director at the time to just 
you know, we need to pretty up that space. It's, there's just too much asphalt, Joss, there's too much concrete. Can you just bring out some trees in pots? And I just thought, I'm not going to do that. That works in Italy where you, you know, you've got beautiful like orangeries to put the pots in when it's winter time and then you bring them out and it's a ceremonial thing and they're beautiful and the trees are mature and all the rest of it. But they very often that it just looks a little bit naff. Um, and so I actually did some CAD drawings and I called up the director of the Museum of Art and just said, I need to do something to activate this space. I think a giant artwork would be fabulous. What can we get in, uh, you know, on loan or whatever? What can we bring in that's cheap? And um, so Charlotte Day was the, is the name of the director. She's still there. And um, she said, Joss, let me see what I can do for you. She found... Um, you know, Ronnie Van Hout's um, RUR, which was developed for uh, the Melbourne Art Fair. And um, she gave me the dimensions of that. I drew it up in CAD for the location. And I said, I think this is going to work. And I showed it to her and she shared it with the artist. And then, you know, they were okay with it. I shared it with my boss and I said, I think that this will be much better than pot plants. I get what you're saying with the pot plants, but they just, you know, it's not going to say world-class university. And that's what our master plan vision says. And we need to bring in something that is meaningful, that is engaging, and that is like, um, you know, at a commensurate quality, because that's what we've been tasked with. We've been tasked with, um, or I'd been tasked with transforming what was a really suburban feeling campus. And I don't mean that in, uh, I don't mean that to sound like a, a dirty word, sorry. Um, but, you know, it, it was a, it was set up as a regional um, university and we'd been tasked with, you know, repositioning Monash, the physical environments of Monash University into um, a world-class university commensurate with its academic reputation. Um, so I guess it sort of started from there and then most of you might, might have seen some of the um, buildings and landscapes that we've implemented since then you know, um, with, with people jumping on board, with the academics getting really excited about the potential um, for the built environment to respond to their, you know, to, to um, emerging pedagogies and things like that. So it, it's been a really, really um, exciting place to work and increasingly over time. Um, the first couple of years were incredibly challenging just because it was sort of one person pushing the design agenda um, at, at the, you know, at the, the officer level, that is. Um, there was certainly the support at the, at the upper level, but there's a fair bit of work on the ground to sort of get that all happening. Um, I was going to say, I think it's safe to say that you need to have those challenging experience, some experiences sometimes when you're holding the banner of design, and it certainly can be challenging at times. So it's great that you won them over and seems like you built a culture of design there and adapted your skills and thought outside the box a little. I think the thing that um, that you really learn when you're the only person pushing design is how do you communicate this in a way that speaks to the values of other people? And people want to be behind a, a great idea. They really, you know, no one's going to stand, but stand in front of a great idea. And so it's about, uh, I think it's just about communicating in it in a way that they can identify with it and then, you know, take it on in, in their own way. And that was um, part of the driver for um, us developing. So I engaged Studio Round to help me develop the, the master plan tagline, which was, it's part of our Monash master plan. Everything that we do on the campus, whether you're an academic or whether you're a maintenance person or whether you're, you know, a, a, um, a, Whatever, whatever your interaction is with the campus, you've got a role to play in the in the vision of Monash and how it evolves as a world class campus. And so um, that was really powerful. Like people felt enabled and um, to to make good decisions um, and to also that they felt sort of. Um, I, I think it, it also gave us, you know. Um, uh, the permission, I guess, to sort of say no to really senior <laughs> academics. No, we can't put a bunning shed there. I, we understand that that's important for the research, but let's look at alternative ways of doing that that support the campus vision. 
There's a phrase commonly used at my work, which is act as if you have a mandate until somebody tells you otherwise. So it sounds like you approach the master plan in that kind of way. Joe, I've spoken a bit about some of the challenges of, um, of that role. What are some of the challenges that you have in your role at the um, Office of the Queensland Government Architect? It's the main challenge in my role, but there's a lot of positives too about being an architect in government. I think I said before, being an architect in government is quite different to being an architect in practice and you really have to grasp, like you said, the opportunities you're given and then really take them as far as you can. And I suppose we have many audiences and many forms in the way that we work. I try to influence projects anywhere from the start all the way through to the end. I guess in a way we see design not necessarily as an outcome but in a process similar to you. So there is many kinds of ways to interact, whether it's helping with design briefs, giving project advice, design reviews, all the way through to, through to very robust discussions around procurement. I think it's something that's quite different and I thoroughly enjoy it because for me there's a lot of broad thinking. I enjoy the kind of thinking at a city scale and thinking about how you can inform good outcomes before they've even been realised. It's something that I've realised through my career in practice. I feel like perhaps there was ways you could influence the built environment beyond the site or beyond the building and that's something that's really enjoyable, enjoyable to me in government in the kind of roles we play in. I feel like we're more like facilitators of good design so the triumph isn't necessarily the fact you've designed a building at the end of the day but it's more the triumph of seeing a building that perhaps you've contributed to even before it was designed before any kind of traditional design process even started. <laughs> no, I agree with that. Like, I love this sort of multifaceted approach to design. It's, it's really enriching, like, having to sort of reframe and rethink, especially when you're working on um, guidelines or frameworks or, you know, where you don't have control over any of the implementation and you have to write it for a diverse audience. And so, you know, how do you do that? that how do you communicate design in plain language and also in a way that um, works for multiple scenarios. Um, I think that's a really interesting thing to have to do. Um, Joe, I was going to I think ask, that, you know, I think that, I'll tell you go. No, no, you go. <laughs> I was going to say, I think the best outcomes always come from collaboration where potentially you've got an agency or a person you're working with who has a problem and they're looking for someone to help solve that problem. I really enjoy those kinds of collaborations. I think architecture, whether it be with heritage or be with health or be with planning, whoever it might be, it's a sort of problem solving exercise. Jo, what's one of your favourite collaboration, you know, examples of collaboration? I think Em mentioned the work that we're doing with Queensland Health at the moment. And that really excites me because we spend 30% of the total budget in Queensland to health. It's a huge economy and we've known for a long time that design and health are related. I think in the current environment it's become even more apparent that there's an interlinked relationship between the built environment and health. And certainly in the past our wide streets, for example, have been designed to try off to try and ward off miasma. And there was an idea about planning and design as an approach to the public health system. And so it makes sense to be collaborating with Queensland Health at the moment. There are some clear indicators around how the environment does impact on health, both physically and mentally. So in a sense, we're trying to describe how a better urban environment will help keep people out of hospitals. And I think that sort of evidence could have a huge ramification on the way that we think about funding, but also future sorts of economic models too. If we spent even 1% of that 30% budget, which is billions of dollars that goes to health on preventative health, in the built environment, for example, we could have some fantastic city outcomes as well as keeping people out of hospital. So that's the kind of collaborations I really enjoy and they're really kind of exciting because thinking out, it's thinking outside the usual urban design box. Jo, I'm so excited to hear about that project. When, when, um, when Emma introduced it, I was like, that is what I've been wanting to explore for decades. Um, I'm so passionate about like <laughs> physical health, preventative health, having come from a really sort of active sporting background. And so, you know, I really want to take that offline with you and um, understand it a bit better and also, you know, see if you're producing anything that we can sort of... Um, or, or whether we can collaborate on anything, at, um, you know, in the work that we're doing at the sort of city scale. Um, that would be really, really exciting. Oh, I'd love to do it. 
Yeah, I'd love to do that. We'll have a chat about it. The way we're approaching it at the moment is that we're developing a methodology and framework. We're working with epidemiologists in the Department of Health who are focused on the metrics and health indicators, and we're helping to categorise them into a healthy framework that's easy to communicate what healthy places look like. We've got a what we call a wheel of good health. It identifies the components and ingredients in the built environment that positively contribute to physical and mental health. They're looking at real data from different departments to provide a snapshot of healthy places from across Queensland. Yeah, fantastic. I want to get, more, <laughs> I want to get more active landscapes into the city. That's what I'm, yeah, I'm really sort of passionate about. I really, I miss the skate park. There, there used to be a skate park in the middle of Melbourne on the um, Queen Victoria Hospital site. Um, and it's a wonderful development what's emerged now, but I just think those opportunities for people to, of all ages, to, um, you know, experience the public realm away from having to buy a coffee or a piece of food or, you know, to, to sort of, um, or engage in commerce, but actually being able to just engage in, you know, physical, uh, physical um, activity and also, you know, emotional connection with just other random people I think that's really important so yeah really keen yeah, to yeah. look at how we might collaborate in a practical yeah. way <laughs> I mean you have some incredible projects down in Melbourne like the raising of the train line intersections you know taking out the level crossings and producing all that incredible new recreation and green space and just think the power of that sort of piece of infrastructure which some people might have deemed very intrusive but actually creating a whole new opportunity to create this inter interconnected, healthy kind of urban environment is such a good example of how some of these big infrastructure projects can actually really create an incredible community outcome. And I noticed a lot of gym equipment, a lot of basketball courts and a lot of active stuff in there. Um, jo, when we, when we spoke, like on Friday, uh, briefly, we talked about, um, I guess, the things, you know, just we talked a little bit about the things that we like to do in our private lives to sort of, I guess, maintain sanity in amongst our really busy professional lives and our really demanding professional lives. I thought that that might be, you know, that's something that I think um, most of the, the people that I've spoken to anyway professionally have seemed to be interested in. Do you want to, um, I don't know, divulge a little bit of that about yourself? <laughs> I don't know if I have much of a private life at the moment, to be honest. I mean, certainly in the past I did, but at the moment with my situation and two kids, I feel like a lot of my time is spent either at work or at home looking after them. But, you know, certainly in the past I've enjoyed participating in a lot of extracurricular activities around the profession. I've always been involved in young professional groups that are a bit more outside of, the, outside of architecture that might involve, say, engineers, practice managers, construction managers, those kinds of professions. I always find it very rewarding because you learn and hear about different experiences with different disciplines. I feel it's very comfortable catching up with my peers and other architectural friends, but sometimes I guess you have to put yourself out there a little bit and try and meet some new people. And there's all sorts of opportunities that come from those experiences. How about you? What do you do outside of work that stimulates your, I guess, creative ambitions? Uh, I have to admit, like, um, my partner calls me a workaholic. Um, and that's mainly, that's mainly because urban design and city design, it's so linked, of course, to what we do in our everyday lives. So I'm constantly sort of assessing, you know, oh, right, that, that's how, you know, people use that sort of space and how can we work that into something or whatever. Or that's a, you know, a great example of, you know, whatever human connection or activation or whatever. Um, so... I I really have to do really kind of like physically immersive things to switch my mind off. <laughs> and one of those things is uh is rock climbing. It's just it's you know we we whenever we can we drive you know a few hours out west and uh, go climbing in the Wimmera. Um, and that's how I switch off. We haven't done any of that lately. I was going to say in the COVID environment, it's so difficult to do the sorts of at those sorts of outdoor activities. I've definitely been feeling cooped up and, like you said, have found a new found appreciation for the outside world and the public realm that's around you. And it's sort of an experiment in understanding what's in your local precinct and what's in your local community that kind of stimulates you while you're feeling trapped inside a little bit. I mean, in your new role, you've been there for three months, Jocelyn. So pretty much 
your entire time at the local government has been in this environment. Is that correct? How's that been? <laughs> yeah, it has. Um, so I started my job at home in my bedroom, which is where I am right now because we don't have a very large house. So I've managed to make a corner of the bedroom look semi-professional. <laughs> Maybe that's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> um, it, look, it, it's... I don't know any different for this job. I mean, the, the COVID environment is the only environment I've known for this job. So, you know, it's funny. I've been, I was talking to a colleague today. We we, we were both at the city of Melbourne. Um, um, it's just easier for us with technology and the way that we have to, the various things that we have to do to, to do our jobs to be there. But, um, you know, he was saying to me, Joss, you have joined the organisation at probably the most challenging time I can ever recall um, in the, the, the 15 years I've been there. And, um, you know, he said, I, I promise you it will get easier than this. And I just don't actually know. Like, it's, it's challenging, but I expected the role to be challenging. <laughs> so it's... Um, yeah. It's been a real, I don't know, it's, um, I, I think the hardest bit is just not being able to connect, you know, person to person with a lot of my staff. I've got a large team. Um, I, think, I think there's about 46 of us. Um, and really, I've gotten to know the principals quite well. So there's about seven principals. But in terms of the broader team, you know, I'm really looking forward to the day when I'm not having to deal with COVID related issues and I can actually just spend time getting to know them one on one and understanding how they work and, you know, the, the strengths that they bring, to, um, the unique strengths that they bring to the team um, in terms of their personal um, design skills and, and, and other skills. So, it, yeah, it's just been a really strange time. <laughs> I think being in more of the delivery side of things, you're probably seeing more projects on the ground. Have you got any sort of projects that have been a direct kind of reaction to the COVID pandemic at a local council level? Yeah, yeah, we have. So we're, we're working um, really industriously at the moment to, as a lot of capital cities are, on, um, on improving bike infrastructure across the city. So the city of Melbourne has, you yep. know, um, been very invested in that, um, in the provision of cycling infrastructure for a long time. We've got our transport strategy, um, which takes us out to 2030, um, but we're fast tracking all of that. So I think we're, we're expecting an announcement to be made any day now. Um, and, and that's, you know, informed by discussions with DOT. And so that's another aspect of the job that is infinitely more complex than any other job I've been in is the number of stakeholders, authorities yep. and partners that um that are now a part of um my everyday world when it comes to project design and delivery um but it is really exciting it's really exciting to actually experience like really experience what it means to be a democracy <laughs> yeah i can imagine there'd be a lot more community consultation involved in what you do at a local council level absolutely yeah definitely and a lot of um just stakeholder and expectation management but it's kind of exciting i mean that's why we do this work right like it's we do yeah, it because it's for people and it's for all people it's not just for a privileged cohort or a, you know sort of well-to-do client or um yeah the kind of things that often come with beautifully and well-designed things mm. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, what about you, Joe? Like, is there anything COVID specific that you're focusing on? Look, there's definitely a lot of discussion around COVID at the moment, you know. Whether it's going to have a lasting impact on urban design and the shape of our cities, I'm unsure. I think certainly it's too early to tell how it might affect city shaping. But I suppose I'm slightly more of a pessimist in the sense. I think potentially COVID won't be the thing that really changes the way we behave, but in fact it might be the recession that we are about to merge into. Our department, which is the Department of Housing and Public Works, is in the business of delivering social housing. So I've been doing some thinking about housing a bit. I hear a lot of people saying there will be some kind of move to the outer suburbs to get away from COVID, but I don't think this is what will drive people away from our cities. A lot of people are losing their jobs and we're in, in, in an industry which a lot of people I know have 
gone down to shorter hours and we're all waiting in anticipation to see whether the construction industry rebounds. I feel like if people start losing their jobs, you start to lose your choices and some choices around housing and where you live. This creates a new kind of anxiety which will have a lasting impact on people's lives. So we're talking a lot about stimulus, certainly in our department, and how social housing can create stimulus. I really hope the governments band together and consider social housing as one of those stimulus packages because there's just so many vulnerable people that need to be housed and it's going to get even worse if there's a lot of people out of work. We've been working with the housing group to see how we can kind of package up stimulus with a focus on good design. I mean, fast tracking can be either dangerous or can be very good. So we're hoping that some of the dwellings can be fast tracked and will come with the promise of good design too. We've been working on some social housing guidelines and we really want to see these design principles in the social housing guidelines embedded in new stimulus work when it comes out. That's probably the closest contact I have with some of the outcomes that are going to come from the COVID at the moment. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I agree. It's so important that we focus on housing right now. And yeah, we've got we've got areas of the um, of the city looking at that too. I've just seen Justine turn on her video. And she's also sent us a message. And I can see some questions coming through on the chat. So what I might do is read out um, the first one that I can see. Um, yeah, what we might do if it works. Is yeah these people to pose their question to you directly so we can see them. Oh yeah, that sounds so, great. So, Deb, Deb Jani, Deb Jani, would you like to turn on your microphone and listen to our speakers? Hi guys. Hi Josephine. Hi Joe. Wonderful talk. Hi. Wonderful talk. Uh, so my question is for both of you and it's with the climate crisis, does sustainability and achieving carbon neutral form an integral part of your master policies and not as an optional or box ticking exercise, but more of a requirement that needs to be achieved. Thanks for that question. Joss, do you want to talk to that? You're probably doing more master planning than I am. Did you want to talk to that initially? I can talk a little bit to it as well. It's, I can't talk about it with any specificity. Um, I should be able to, but I'm still sort of catching up on all of those, uh, on all of our different strategies and things. Sustainability is absolutely a, a, an important aspect of what we do at the City of Melbourne. I think one of our, uh, our goals is for a sustainable city. And so um, it is front and centre of everything that we do. I mean, we were, uh, and the City of Melbourne has, you know, um, I guess invested a lot in being a leader in that space so you know we're, we're looking at the moment just looking at a small project looking at the, the moment at using um, recycled um, uh, lane separators for our COVID-19 bike lanes um, we, I'm working in one of the city's first sustainable buildings um, uh, yeah it's absolutely a, a, a um, not just an aspiration but a, a requirement for um, City of Melbourne works that we um, integrate sustainability into them um, but I can I can follow up with you you know outside the scope of this conversation with more specifics if you like that would be good yeah that would be great <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I work in private practice and uh, I work in healthcare, so and I'm in Sydney, so NSW Health. And what I increasingly see is that there is a lack of aspiration on that aspect yeah. from the client side. And even when we propose something, often in the name of cost cutting or value engineering, that gets cut out, which means it's not a requirement. It's more like, okay, if we can do it, we can do it. So I'm just wondering, like, we can push for it, like from the architect side, because all architects always have the best of intentions. Like we always want to do good for the world. And like, but somehow like we face a roadblock because if it doesn't come from the client side, if it doesn't come as a policy top down. And I think this is also a question also for Josephine, like as somebody who makes policies, like, um, I don't know, maybe the NSW Health is behind the Victoria uh, and Melbourne government and Queensland government, I don't know. But I'm just trying to understand, like, what is the current climate with your um, offices where you are working with the climate emergency, that's all. Look, I think the question you've raised is probably one we grapple with just as much as you do. 
Because while we give advice to different agencies, there's got to be a willingness to listen. And I think sustainability, certainly in the work we do, is talked about in a very ambitious kind of way. And you'll probably see it in planning policy and in various policies, yet when it comes to the crunch you're working in, and you're working in capital works, you're in a completely different environment and it's the first thing that goes really. I think the biggest wins we're getting, I know in Queensland, is around building and legislation policy, so taking it more into a legislative environment. So you're partly influencing through building codes in order to enact some of these sustainability policies, but of course that's always dealing with the lowest common denominator it's not about innovation, it's about, I guess, raising the bar, so so to speak, so to speak, for the broader industry. So I totally hear you, and we have exactly those same discussions, and when we do design review, it's one of the questions we always ask. It's certainly in our urban design policies that sustainability needs to be benchmarked. It needs to be a priority on projects, and projects need to be looking at it, but unfortunately, as you said, time and time again, we find that it gets dropped off, and it's really an unfortunate thing. And I don't know if I can actually answer the question on as to how to elevate the conversation around sustainability because it's quite disappointing that we're in 2020 and we're still seeing it as an add-on rather than something that's embedded in most projects. Sorry, I don't know if that answered your question. No, that's fine. It's more just about a conversation, you know, about what's happening. And especially from both of you, since you are one of you as a policymaker and the other one is working from the client side and different states. So again, interesting. So yeah, it's just more of a discussion, I guess, like three of us or 70 people participating here can't do anything <laughs> at this moment, but we can all, I guess, try and keep pushing for it. Justine, I might just say one more thing. Um, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals have been really helpful in both the previous, um, uh, my previous place of employment as well as at the City of Melbourne. So we often refer to those as the benchmark for what we should be aiming for. Um, and, and there's something that we've rolled into uh, the current work on the, the City of the Future Task Force, which a lot of our senior um, uh, general managers are, are, looking, are working on. So what is the future of Melbourne having a reference to the sustainable development um, goals set by the United Nations? So I think Pam McGurr's question follows on quite nicely. Um, and so we've got this love, you know, these lovely series of questions coming through, which kind of build on each other. So Pam, do you want to turn on your microphone for a moment? And <laughs> Sure. Hi, Justine. Hi. And hi, everyone. And thanks, Jocelyn and Josephine. Great talk and great to hear your experiences. So my question is perhaps more broadly about value engineering and value management really when budgets are low and aspirations are high, as we know they often are in public projects, what aspects of design do you prioritise? I know mean, sustainability is one, but is there, rather than sort of, I was interested in what you did prioritise, but I understand there's probably many things you can talk about, but perhaps you could talk about the strategies that you use to make those decisions or what's at the top of your list that keeps design teams motivated and wins over stakeholders with long shopping lists and have you got examples to share on these things? Jo, do you mind if I start? Yeah, go for it. So to, to um, thanks Pam, it's a really, really great question. And for me, design always starts with a vision. What is the vision? Uh, of the particular project or, you know, uh, that we're aiming for here. And so, you know, I, I think that that's the, the absolute thing that we need to sort of um, define in the first place for any undertaking and then work back from there. So if that's the vision, well, what is the, the sort of idealised outcome? And then how do we phase delivery to sort of account for the available resources right now, but also allow for the, a future end state which, which aligns with that vision? So I think it's always about sort of in any project, there's always compromise, there's always uh, value management, but at least if we can get the bones of the project, you know, the, 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 the bones right, then the rest can sort of follow. But if we don't get the, the basics of it right, then it kind of stuffs up any sort of bigger vision beyond that. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a specific example. So um, I, I won't use a city example just because I'm still really new there. And, you know, a lot of what we say is really sensitive and very um, uh, to topical. So I'll stick with a university one. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, you know, one of the big ones there was just getting the circulation right. Um, Monash Clayton, the flagship campus for Monash University, is a 100 hectare campus, um, 100 buildings, uh, 100 plus buildings on that site. And, you know, one of the first things we, we sort of um, did was to deliver a series of, um, I, or to identify and deliver a series of um, primary walks on that campus. And we got, you know, there was so much backlash about it before they were delivered. Oh, these are going to be windswept, you know, tunnels and all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, there's never going to be the traffic on campus to sort of warrant six metre ride a six metre wide um, walkways, but we stuck to it. And in instances where we could, we put in the, the, the granite and instances where we couldn't, we just marked it out. And um, so, you know, it got de delivered very, very slowly and it's still in delivery. Um, but that's been a really, really um, big part of that campus's transformation. And also a big part of now the language of Monash, like when you step onto any Monash campus, you can tell you're on a Monash campus because of its streetscapes. And funnily enough, I will bring it back full circle to City of Melbourne because we actually took that model from the City of Melbourne. We looked at their streetscapes and we looked at the, the introduction of the bluestone that was um, uh, that helped to build, you know, a, uh, that sense of quality city and decided that, um, that, that, that Monash University, that was something that we needed to invest in there. I don't, I don't know if that was, is a fitting analogy or fits in with what you were hoping to get out of that question, but I might throw over to Jo because she'll, she'll probably approach it in a different way, which might help to round out our answers. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one because again, we're not always um, in the cold face of value management. I, I'm certainly a part of a value management exercise at the moment on a project that I'm working on. So I have a bit of first -hand experience, but I suppose, Part of what we do in advocacy is actually advocating very early before a project is even realised. And one of the frustrations we have is often capital works budgets aren't um, necessarily reflective of what is required. So you have you know grand aspirations, yet you have a um, very low budget and what and to actually deliver it. So we're continually kind of having conversations how we can inform business cases and inform um, kind of work very early on and have better design briefs very early on before the project even goes to site. So I suppose in some ways, sometimes to avoid some of those issues, it's also good to kind of make sure you're planning the project correctly. I mean. I would agree with what Joss has said too. The project I'm working on at the moment, which is in a sort of value management exercise, it's it is over budget, and so we've had to come back to basic principles. Of what are the key, what are, we always ask ourselves? What are the key city making moves that are you know essentially going to make this project as the best it can be? And so some of those, like you talked about, is you know it's kind of connection to the street, it's activation, it's interface with the public because that's where the building's going to have the greatest presence. And I, I I mean I'm sure it's different for every project depending on what the typology is and what the kind of um, you know the intent of the project is. But we're being I suppose the group that we are, we always focus on urban design and public realm. And so we want to see projects that really give the most back to the community and that, you know, the most back to the kind of the broader, uh, the broader kind of context. Okay. Um, maybe, <laughs> sorry, is that, Emma Healy, maybe we might flip to you with your um, question about gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe and Jocelyn, that was awesome. Um, I think I, um, actually what I was getting at was just that sometimes budgets can actually um, enhance sustainability. I'm just finding on some projects where the value management process is pretty rigorous that, um, that actually it's forcing me to kind of interrogate myself on what I'm doing and go, well, actually do we need that? And does can we tell the same story or achieve the same functional outcome in a different way that maybe uses less resources? So I guess it's not a question, it's, it's more of a statement that just sort of followed on from Joe, what Joe was getting at. I think it's like not always, I don't think you always need the big budgets to achieve sustainability depending on what kind of project it is. Um, I agree on that. One thing we're trying to do as an example in the social housing space, there's always the business as usual outcomes and there's a budget typically allocated to it. 
and the work that we're doing through a number of demonstration social housing projects, we're trying to work with architects to essentially deliver projects to the same budget that would be delivered by a commercial developer. We're working really hard with our architects to find ways in which we can deliver a product that's still reflective of good design principles, but is far more affordable and sustainable. And it's a challenge. It's always a challenge and it's not an easy task. But we believe you don't always have to do the same thing. It doesn't always have to be typical outcomes, that you, the typical outcomes you see for social housing. And what we're doing is working. It takes a lot more of involvement with the architects and collaboration with the client, who in this case is the department. But we're seeing some really good outcomes that are coming out, coming out on comparative budgets. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the typology in some ways, doesn't it? Like, um, yeah, certain typologies, the lower budgets can actually, yeah, help. But in other ways, um, I think on the big public projects, maybe not so much, but. I think we'll have one more um, question and then we're going to try this experiment with the breakout rooms. Um, so you'll have to bear with us with that as well. But um, uh, Natural Narula, I think we've got a good question here, which comes back to the kind of pandemic context that we're in. And I think might be a good way to sort of wrap, wrap up this component. So do you want to turn on your um, camera and video? And we'll see how we go. Hello everyone, thanks for such a good talk. It's been really informative. Actually, I have, I've just started working on this project. I'm from Geelong, I'm in Deakin University. And we have sort of started analyzing the green spine project that has been done in Mallop Street. And we are studying about patterns of biophilic design and how we can incorporate them in the Mallop Street. But what I've been thinking is that certainly that space, our intervention would be, would have been different if, if, if it was pre-COVID and it would be really different if it's now, if we are going to intervene now. So my question is that, uh, is it a part of the strategies that uh, there will be some work on how the public spaces will be designed and will be used in post-pandemic settings? Is it a part of the agenda on how public spaces will be designed post pandemic? Because the virus is actually becoming the new normal. And even though we are trying to return to a normal pace of life, I think till the vaccine doesn't come up, people would be scared to, they, there will be reluctance in use of public spaces. So I was wondering if you can elaborate on that a little bit. Now, Shell, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name properly. Is your question about social distancing? So this new metric that we're all having to deal with of the 1.5 metres away from any, any person? Yes. So how will that affect the design and use of different public spaces? Yeah, yeah. I think, look, it's a really, really great question. I think it's, it's the question that's at the forefront of every business owner's <laughs> Uh, and every civic department's lips at the moment. So, you know, this is where the bicycle infrastructure is really important because it will help to hopefully alleviate um, uh, congestion and reliance on public transport and also on cars. Um, uh, the other thing that a lot of cities around the world are doing, including the city of Melbourne, is looking at how can we very quickly, um, you know, uh, um, enhance the amount uh, the proportion of the streetscape that is dedicated to pedestrians right now because you know some of the laneways in Melbourne and other parts of Australia are quite narrow um, so how can we buy back space particularly while traffic um, is relatively low like vehicular traffic is relatively low at the moment um, I think the next big frontier um, and we're already starting to see businesses capitalise on this. So I, I had an email update the other day about the first building, the first office building in Australia that had adopted the six foot distancing rule. And they'd um, literally marked out, you know, which workstations are safe to use um, in relation to other workstations. They had a one way circulation system through their building, um, uh, you know, and then, I, I'm not sure, but then you've got, you know, how, questions around how do you access foyers and communi communal facilities like bathrooms and things like that in a really um, safe way. So 
I think we're going to see a lot of movement in this space. We, we're not going to figure it all out straight away. I think it's going to be an evolving um, thing in much the same way that, you know, um, uh, I guess 9-11 affected uh, uh, airport um, procedures and planning. Um, Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Not really. I think that's the sort of short-term view where, the, where we're still very conscious of social distancing. And I guess it's yet to be seen with the long term whether we need to maintain those kinds of distances. But I think you're right. I think for me the biggest kind of opportunity is in the active transport and public realm. And certainly our office has developed a strategy called the Green Grid, which is very similar to New South Wales, who have implemented a green grid. And likewise, I think Victoria's probably got some similar ideas, particularly the city of Melbourne as well. But this idea is that you actually interconnect public realm and green space with really walkable, cycle-friendly kinds of ribbons of active green, which create all sorts of recreational opportunities. I think these kinds of strategies align really well to the idea to improve walkability and cyclability. So you can get where you need to go and not have to rely on cars and public transport. But also the idea that everyone should have green space and some recreational space outside the front door that they can access without having to jump into a car. So from more of an urban design space, and again, it comes back to health as well, I hope that there's a renewed interest in public realm and actually creating more or better public realm that is comfortable that people can use in the future as an essential aspect of our lives. Joe, in some ways, I think this relates a little bit um, to your earlier comment about, you know, this sort of romanticization of the suburbs again and suburban living. I think that this whole idea of the sort of, you know, um, local walkable um, community is going to be so much more important moving forward. So having that sort of proximity to open space and potentially there may be a new um, wave of local milk bars and the like, which I really enjoyed when I was a kid, <laughs> coming back into, you know, into sort of um, the planning of our, our suburbs and regional and uh, regional um, and suburban centres, I suppose. I mean, I hope so. Brisbane itself is a city of villages, much like Melbourne is. And I think the more we can plan around those individual and local communities to make them more walkable, more active and more engaging, the better. I hope personally that we see some kind of really interesting outcomes within activity centres, moving away from more the big box shopping centres and see more activated high streets with plenty to see and do. It's yet to be seen though. I mean, the government's announced a lot of road projects. So to me, I'm seeing a lot of business as usual announcements coming out. But these are some of the priorities of the community, particularly in regional communities, which we have to consider.